Good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Wow, it's absolutely amazing to be here. Um, this is our fourth annual conference now, and I think just every year it gets bigger and bigger. It's just fantastic to have you here. Um, my name's James Innes. Um, I'm a pharmacist by background, um, so I've worked for this organisation for about 15 years now. Um, I'm also associate director for QI, so it's great to have you here. So I wanted to start this session talking about this gentleman, Dr. Avedis Donabadian. Have any of you heard of him before? Show of hands if you have. Okay, so a few. So I'll tell you a little bit about this man before we go further. So he was born in Beirut, Lebanon, 1912. And he lived there um, and moved between there and, and Palestine, now Jerusalem, for his first sort of 30 years. He was the son of a doctor. He thought about what he, he wanted to do, and he ended up qualifying um, as a doctor, going to the University of Beirut. He then spent uh, 10 years practicing um, in Jerusalem, um, at this place, the English Mission Hospital, and also as a family doctor. About 10 years later, he got the opportunity to go and study for a master's in public health at Harvard University, where he spent four years. After that, spent a little bit of time in New York, before eventually he'd made, he'd made his way to the University of Michigan, which is where he spent the rest of his working career as a professor of public health. So Avedis was a real thought leader. He was genuinely one of the first people who uh, understood healthcare as a system. And he was also one of these people who started to talk about very early on that doctors, nurses, other health professionals don't really get taught about systems leadership as part of their degrees. He published 11 books. He published 100 different articles through his time. And it's this article that he published in 1966, which is probably what he's most famous for. It's called Evaluating the Quality of Medical Care. And really what he did, he, he added so much to the field of quality to help people understand how to measure and evaluate quality. And he came up with this equation, structure, plus process equal outcome. So when he was talking about structure, he was really getting on about all the, the factors that affect the environment in which um, the care is delivered. So that might be the physical facilities, your hospital, your community mental health teams, the equipment, the staff, how the organisation is organised, are you organised in directorates or services, and even training. And he also uh, talked about the process, and the process is the way in which care is delivered. So how we refer people and take referrals, admissions, how we diagnose, how we treat, how we educate our um, service users, how we um, think about population health, and also how we identify quality issues and improve. Now, about a few years ago, um, our colleagues at the IHI suggested adding one other thing as well, culture. We all know how important culture is to delivering good quality. There is so much evidence out there to say that if you've got engaged staff, the clinical outcomes for patients are even better. So this got me thinking really, is using um, Donna Bajian's approach, which is still used today, how about we take that approach and think about our organisation, East London Foundation Trust, and how this applies. So this is our house. We have one pillar which is our structure, one pillar which is our process, and one which is our culture. And up the top on the roof we have our outcomes. So I thought I'd just spend 10 minutes or so looking at how we are as an organisation in relation to this. So let's start. So I guess the first thing is we have many different structures that really focus in on quality and making sure we deliver the highest quality. And these range from meetings to boards to committees, but I think what is definitely sure is that compared to other organisations in the UK, we have so many of these that focus purely on just quality because we think it's that, that important. You'll go, when you uh, go back for your tea, you'll see numerous stands for life QI and all these other things. And what matters to me is that we build structures that help staff and service users understand what's kind of going on. So we have life QI, which is where all our QI work happens. People record their projects, they do their PGSAs, they do their data analysis, they create their driver diagrams, all there. 
We have now thousands upon thousands of different charts. If you want to find out what your violence levels are in your units or your waiting times, you can find that real time for people so they can start to think about if they want to improve it. You all booked onto this conference via the QI microsite. Uh, that's, that was started from nothing. It's a, a simple WordPress site. It's now seeing around about 40,000 views a month. So it really has become something quite important. And we're even testing something at the moment using an Improve Well app to help people measure their own enjoyment at work as a part of a wider system. So for me, it's always what can we do to make it easier for staff to do the right thing? Talking about people, we try to invest in our people. And in relation to quality, we have all these people who are active QI coaches in the organisation. These are all normal members of staff, clinicians, managers, who also have a role of supporting, a ring fence role for supporting QI projects in the organisation. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we have 40 new coaches joining us for this year who are starting their training. So this, this, this list of pictures will, it will increase. But that is really, really important to us. We have QI sponsors, because it doesn't just need somebody who knows how methodology works. You need to have people who can break down barriers and champion the cause. And these are our sponsors. And finally, we've invested in a you know, relatively small central quality improvement and quality assurance team. I think when you were walking up, you saw all these stats on the screens of how many people train. We have uh, 10 different courses now for helping people understand how to build quality. All the way uh, at the start, for people who don't even work in this organisation yet, our, our students at City University, our psychologists, we, we train them through to our staff with modular courses, six-month courses, coaching courses. We do exactly the same for our service users and, and carers. We think that's really, really important. And to date, um, we've now trained just under 2,500 people in, in four years. Um, if you look at the different courses, this gives you a sense of the proportions. You can see our two biggest ways of training people are Pockets QI, which is our two half days modular course, and our six month improvement science and action course. So that's a little bit about the structures, but what about the processes? So this is something that's an evolution, but we now have in place a, a way of managing and starting to help people plan out their improvement work. So it starts all the way maybe in February, when you're actually asking your patients, your clinicians, your frontline staff, what matters? What matters now? What are people saying? What do we need to improve? And that, in turn, helps different directorates and services prioritise what they are going to work on over the coming year with their QI projects. So things are linked together in a kind of a single way. If you imagine this, this lovely road is the, the process for how you do a QI project, Here's our beloved little car, which is a QI project itself. And it starts all the way here, where a new project kind of gets created. You drive along the road, it gets registered on Life QI, and it gets approved. And you mo slowly move your way through this map, all the way through as you test and test and get improvement, until, until eventually, hopefully, you end up in this car park here of completed projects, where you've made, made the difference. So 221 projects in total in the organisation that we've had so far, 139 active projects at the moment, 82 have actually done what they needed to do and completed. I think it's amazing, absolutely amazing. These are not easy problems. These are all problems that matter most to people on the front line, and they're complex problems. There are no magic bullets here. And the key thing about that is that each of those projects are homegrown, matter most to people on the front line. They're prioritised locally in each directorate as well. And we also have trust-wide priorities as well, which is where something like violence, for example, won't just be an issue for one unit, two units. It's an issue across the entire organisation, so we support that as well. So let's finish off with this final pillar, culture. What about the culture? So for me, there's two things that always pop out in my mind. The first is what we say to every new member of staff on their induction when they start in this trust. You have two jobs. The job of doing your job and the job of improving your job, which I think is really, really important. And this one is particularly important to me. We firmly believe that people on the front line, 
that staff and patients are best placed to understand what's going on, to see what needs to be done and to come up with changes for improvements. The job of senior leadership in this organisation is to create the system and the environment to allow that to happen, not to tell people what to do. And that's our, our mantra. And I do think it comes in with our trust values here at the bottom. We care, we respect and we are inclusive. At the core of that are our service users and our carers. And I think that is really very, very much part of who we are. All of our projects, we, we look for improvement with service users, having them part of the team, whether it's Little Eye, which is where on an occasional basis you'll check in, you'll see, you'll run focus groups, through to Big Eye, which is where you have a service user as an equal member of the project team. The majority of our involvement is all Big Eye, which I think is really, really powerful, ably supported by our PPO team. And the culture extends, I think, to our board as well. Our executive um, boards are doing, on average, 30 executive walk rounds every month. So that's an executive member going and spending time with the frontline team, asking them how things are going, what helps, what gets in the way. That's uh, far beyond most other organisations in the UK. And it comes also to the way that the trust, looks, the trust board looks at information. We do not use rag ratings, red, amber, green. We use data over time. And the way that we think and the way we question what's going on is very, very different as well. Has anybody seen any of the QI walls in Trust Headquarters or in the Newham Centre for Mental Health? That tells me culture. We, we put it out there. We like graffiti. We like to talk about our journey and what we're doing. And if, if you go, this one actually won a World Illustration Award, would you believe? Um, for the work, all created by staff and service users. We publish where we can as well. We believe it's really, really important when we're doing this work, this tricky work, that where we can, we publish results and we share our learning so others can learn from us. And we've published in a, in a variety of different journals. And when we can, we try to celebrate as well. Improving is tough. We're dealing with complex problems and it's important to sometimes stop to look back and give yourself a pat on the back and say, well done. And where we can, we, we try to get people winning national awards. These are all frontline teams who've done that. So there are three pillars, but what about outcomes? So I'm not going to be able to talk to you about every single one of the 90 or so projects that have seen results, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavour of what's there. And for me, that flavour needs to demonstrate the different areas we work on, whether it's making things more effective, like reducing waiting times, whether it's making things safer, whether it's about giving a better experience for our, our service users and, in fact, for our, um, our staff as well. So let's start off with Luton. This is the team in Luton. They've been doing great work to reduce the time it takes to be seen by the psychology service in the CMHTs. They've tried a few different things, but the key thing they ended up doing was a new referral pathway. And you can see they've managed to reduce the length of time for people waiting by 50%. Similar thing in Beds and Newton as well. And this is um, getting access and reducing the time it takes for people to get access to um, the OT service for people with learning disabilities. And what they had was a problem before where other people were taking priority all the time. So they tried 10 different change ideas from telephone triage to changing their processes. I'm really proud to see, say that they've managed to reduce that waiting time by 44%. And there's a patient at the end of that who's being seen more quickly. Another one very close to my heart. Um, my mum, my own mother, has dementia, and this one matters to me quite a lot. Getting people a diagnosis of dementia as quickly as possible. And these guys worked on this. They won a national award for this at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And they managed to reduce um, the time taken to get that diagnosis of dementia by 54% by trying out different ways of trying to reduce DNAs, trying DNA policies, trying texting and different things like that. Fantastic results. And finally, this is very recent. Um, in our um, CAM services, our children's and adolescent services, they've been working to uh, reduce waiting times as well into their pathway trying a variety of different things, seeing a 55% reduction. They are amazing results, each and on of them themselves. So how about safety? That's a